So our final session is some reflections from people who are elected representatives uh, in, in the Irish context today. Uh, and I'm going to welcome back to the stage Dr. James Casey of the ILMI, who's going to chair this session for us. Uh, but we're also joined by Deputy Ivana Bacic of uh, the Labour Party, Deputy Pauline Tully of Sinn Féin, and Senator Martin Conway of Fine Gael. So true uh, bipartisanship or cross-party cross collaboration, we hope, in this session. Tripartisan. Tripartisan. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so just while everybody's taking their seats, um, I'll give a little bit more information about James because uh, we didn't have the opportunity when he was a panelist. Um, so uh, James Casey is policy officer in the Independent Living Movement of Ireland, uh, but he also has a PhD in critical disability studies from NUIG. Uh, he's worked as a teacher, as a disability equality consultant, and as a communications worker. Uh, he's a peer reviewer with several international journals, uh, and apparently does some writing himself, and then we just heard earlier about his film critic career. Uh, so uh, very many uh, fingers in very many pies there. Uh, but I will hand over to you, I'm very much looking forward to the perspectives of our elected representatives on what they've heard today. Thank you. So thank you very much, everybody. I know you're probably sick of listening to me already. I'm sick of listening to me, so I, I appreciate that. And I, I think it was great. And thank you very much for the NDA for, for doing Article 29 about political participation. Um, and what we'll talk about political participation and talk to politicians. So we have three fantastic politicians here. Um, we have Pauline Tully, who is a Sinn Féin from uh, Cavan. Yes. Cavan. Ivana Bacic, Labour leader from Dublin. This constituency. This constituency. Dublin Bayside. Sorry. The wonderful the, Dublin Bayside. I don't You're really all very welcome. Well. You're all very welcome. And then Martin Cobb. You're Fianna Fáil, Martin, are you? No, oh. I'm only... <laughs> Martin, Co Martin Conway from Fianna Gael, Senator Martin Conway. Don't let my wife hear you say that. <laughs> so, thank I thought you were going to explode there, Martin. Yeah. Where are you from, Martin? County Clare. Oh, County Clare, sorry. So, I mean... We, we heard a lot of things today, and I know I, I appreciate it was a long day, and there was a lot of opinions, a lot of perspectives, and, you know, the government representatives, governments can't do everything, but they could do a lot. Um, and Ireland is a social democracy, or well, I hope it's a social democracy. And like I said, local politics is everything. Everything comes from the grassroots up, and people drive policy. So I think possibly the first question that, that I have to to you guys today is, like, what, what, what is your individual political party doing to make sure that disabled people are part of that process, whether it's consultation in regards to policy or making sure that if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, do you know, I'd love to go as a local councillor in Westport or Mullingar or, you know, Port Leisha, will they be supported at that level? Um, and, 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 and is there a mechanism for that or is it something that you need to take into account? So I, I'm just going to go, like, as I see people allow me, so I'm going to start with Pauling. So Pauling, if that, and we've got, I think, six minutes each to talk about that. Okay. Um, when I became spokesperson for disability for the party there in 2020, I'm thinking of, like, nothing without us, nothing about us without us. Mm. I actually established a working group from party members of disabled people or parents of disabled children to inform me about what I was doing in the Dáil. So we would meet uh, via Zoom uh, once a month or maybe sometimes once every two months and talk about the work of the Disability Matters Committee and uh, what we were doing there, what was coming up, what they would like to see come up, what, what, you know, what they felt was important. But they would also talk about wider policy issues as well. So you know, I, can, I continued that, continued to meet people and discuss uh, issues with them. So I think that's very important. Um, we are very conscious of a number of issues when we're looking for local election candidates, or election candidates in general, but if local elections are coming up next year. So we have a, a gender policy where you must have uh, whether two candidates, one male, one female, but we are also being cognizant of the fact that we must broaden out um, who our, our, who our people are, who are standing for us. So disabled people, people from different ethnic backgrounds, people from different countries, the new Irish. So we, we want to include more people. So we're being conscious of that and being constantly reminded of that. Now, the last local elections in County Cavan in 2019, one of our candidates was a wheelchair user. Um, unfortunately, she didn't get elected. I think if it had been 2014, she probably would. It was a better election for Sinn Féin. We just didn't do well uh, in the local elections across um, the country. But she actually you know, did very well 
Island First Preferences, but she's a, an excellent community activist as well, but unfortunately just didn't get in at the end, didn't get the transfers to get in. Um, so, and I know I've just recently met another of our candidates who's just, at the time she was going forward for a convention in Longford, mm. um, and she's a wheelchair user as well, young woman from Edgerstown, and she has since been selected at convention. So she will be standing for us. So we are trying to support as many people as possible to, to go forward. So women and uh, with a disability, we're, we're hitting two of our, our milestones on that. So mm. that's that's just some of the things we're doing. Um, I also, I suppose, have a motion, our Ardesh is coming up in a few weeks, and I have a motion put forward to it um, to ensure that going forward, all our offices and our maintenance spaces are accessible and to as, do as much as possible to make our current offices accessible because they are not all. Now, some of people have entered into leases and they, they just can't get out of it or, you know, the, the, it would just take us to, so too much, but we are looking at ways to make our offices much more accessible and our meeting rooms as well. Yeah, and just, and just I suppose, I, I pose a question because we have a couple of minutes left and then I go on to Ivana. Um, again, about the policy, the policy formation within within your political party and, and, and been driven by the people it's going to be affected by. Do you have a mechanism for that or how is that going? I'll start pulling to go on to you. How, how is that going with Sinn Féin? Yeah, I mean, look, we have to be cognizant, and I'm constantly reminding all of the spokespeople there, and you know, when we were doing our alternative budget, you must disability proof the budget. Yeah. Um, you know, and so to, to look at that, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, I'm even constantly reminding all of our members that they have to do the, the autism training, for example, that's coming up. They should have it done by now. They haven't it done. We want to make the doll uh, 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 autism-friendly parliament. And to get the accreditation, they must undertake the training. So it's a constant reminder. It's not that people aren't conscious of it, but unfortunately, they still need to be reminded. And that has to change. It has to become sec second nature that everything is disability-proofed. Thanks very much. I appreciate that, Pauline. Hi, Vanna, can I have the same question for you, just about supporting people? How are Labour supporting people with, with disabled people to go for election or get involved in your party politics on a local level? Um, and then I'll ask you the other thing then again about how, is, how, is, how are you forming Labour policies around disability? Well, thank you very much, James. And may I say again, you're all very welcome. Falter of Galer, go uh, Dublin Bay South, my, my lovely constituency. It's great to be, to be here and, uh, and, and I'm delighted to be part of this. So the Labour Party, the party I'm proud to lead, has a really strong track record of working on disability rights. We have a very, very proactive uh, section, Labour Disability, uh, which for many years was led by the wonderful Mick Keegan, who uh, many of you will know. Uh, we've also got a proud track record of election candidates with disabilities. I'm thinking of our, my dear comrade Declan Mina, who's our councillor in Dublin Central, and Terry O'Brien, our councillor in Tralee. And the most recent selection convention I had the honour to speak at was in Clonakilty in Cork South West, where we selected Evie Nevin as a candidate for the locals next year. And some of you will know Evie has been a very, very power powerful and outspoken disability rights advocate. And uh, so, you know, we're really hopeful she'll get over the line and join our team of councillors at the local elections next year. So it's been a priority of mine, uh, not just since I became leader, but throughout my political career, to ensure more diversity in politics. My own name is somewhat more diverse than many names. My dad is, uh, my father came here as a child. His family came from the Czech Republic as refugees in the 40s, so that, hence the name. But my mother is a Murphy from County Clare, as Martin knows. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but, but, the, but I think, joking aside, diversity, as Pauline has said, is hugely important mm -hmm. in politics. We need to see a more representative political system. So a particular passion of mine has been fighting to see more women in politics and that means women with disabilities, disabled women, women from ethnic minorities, traveller women, uh, women of all ages because uh, you know women make up as we all know more than half the population, less than one quarter of our TDs are women. This is a grossly, this panel is grossly <laughs> uh, disproportionate to the, in, to the reality uh, of, the, of, the gov of the government and opposition benches in the Dáil. 23% of our TDs are women, only 37 of us out of 160. It's shameful. It has to change. Uh, some years ago, James, I did a report uh, for the Justice Committee on women's participation and we identified five C's which obstruct women's entry to politics. And looking at the wonderful things you've been debating today, so many of them are relevant to Article 29 and the participation of disabled people in politics. Those five C's obstruct underrepresented groups. Lack of cash, for women and for people with disabilities. Lack of confidence, because we're not conditioned to be as confident as the, t the, the, the typical or stereotypical politician. Uh, 
a culture that is an old boys culture that tends to work against women in politics, but also works against people from different back backgrounds, from more diverse backgrounds. Uh, lack of childcare, very particular issue for women, and of course, candidate selection procedures. So as a result of our report, uh, a number of things changed. We produced that report in 2009. We got the gender quota in place as a result, James, so that now uh, political parties must select uh, at least 30% of their candidates of each gender. That rises to 40% for the next general election. So all of us as political party uh, members and activists are recruiting, actively, proactively recruiting more women. But that also must include more women with disabilities, more disabled women, and more women from diverse backgrounds. And I suppose just to finish, to say the other reason I'm really glad to be here is uh, because I chaired the Oireachtas Committee on Gender Equality last year, and one of our key recommendations was a referendum to change Article 41 of the Constitution to value care. And one of the key things that we looked at was how you ensure a valuing of care that recognises the autonomy of those who, who receive care, as well as recognising the contribution made by carers and those who are receiving care. And we heard some really powerful testimonies from disabled women's groups uh, and from people with disabilities in the context of that debate. And our recommendations, I think, also support greater participation by disabled people. I do want to just say Duncan Smith is my Labour colleague, who is our disability spokesperson, who's speaking in the Dáil on disability this afternoon. Uh, I was on the Disability Matters Committee as a senator, so I know the great work that's being done there. So we do work on a cross-party basis on mm. this issue. Uh, thanks very much, Ivana. Um, and Martin, I appreciate that. I'm going to come back to you again, though, about the policy question before we finish. Uh, Martin, but I should sorry, Labour disability, yeah. Labour disability are the main section within the party that would push for policies on disabled rights. So, for example, at our party conference, which is our policy-making vehicle, Labour disability activists often lead the debate and and push us all on in to ensure policy. Sorry, I meant to. Uh, I thanks very much, and I appreciate that, Deputy Pacek. Martin, Senator Conway. How are you? I'm not too bad. How are you keeping? It's great. It's, it's great to be here. And you know, it, it's great to be in a panel with uh, these two wonderful ladies. And I was on television the other night and I kind of felt very alone because I was the only male on the panel. <laughs> So, more of that. More so of that. more of that is right, absolutely. So I suppose, look at what, what has Fine Gael done uh, to, uh, I suppose, promote uh, the um, participation of people with disabilities and the election of people with disabilities. The first thing they've done is they've facilitated me being elected uh, as a member of the Oireachtas. As somebody with 16% eyesight, and to flip that, that means I'm 84% blind. Uh, I am the only member of the current Oireachtas with a declared disability, mm -hmm. and I'm Fine Gael. And, you know, that didn't happen by chance. Um, I was um, facilitated to be a local election candidate in 2004, and again in 2009. And I have a firm belief that, you know, and this extends to all walks of life when it comes to people with disabilities. If people with disabilities get a chance and get an opportunity, and they put their head down and they work hard, well, the results will come. And I, I use myself as an example when it comes to that. I got the opportunity. The people of Cl North Clare elected me a councillor in 2004. 2009, I topped the poll and was re-elected. So that was a vindication that somebody with a disability can actually do the job of a, politi a politician in the front line. Then I ran for the Senate in 2011, and I was elected, fortunately. And again, the same principle applied. I was given the opportunity to go into the Shannon, work hard, represent myself, my party, my constituency, and uh, in, to a certain extent, people with disabilities, even though you know, representing people with disabilities is very varied and very different. I concentrate in many ways on the whole area of eye care sight loss because of my own personal experience in that area. And I can go through the, the, the enormous achievements that uh, uh, has hap have happened in the whole world of sight loss as a direct result of having somebody in the Oireachtas with sight loss. So that proves having somebody elected with a disability can impact and change and improve the lives of people with disabilities. And again in 2011 I was given that opportunity and I was vin the, um, the decision of the councillors of Fine Gael to elect me uh, and take a chance on me in 2011 uh, was vindicated in 2016 when I was re-elected and again in 2020 uh, when I was re-elected in two subsequent elections that were very, very difficult for Fine Gael uh, uh, as they had lost um, uh, many, many uh, Shannon votes uh, during that period. Uh, but I, I believe in leading by example. I believe in going out and doing the job. 
Yes, there are challenges. Uh, because of my SI difficulties, I don't recognise faces. And in Ireland, recognising faces is a huge advantage yeah. politically. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I don't drive, and I represent a rural constituency. Could, could you please be quiet? If you don't want to listen to me, that's fine, but just do some bit of respect. Um, uh, in 2000, uh, I, I don't drive, so because of that, um, I represent a rural constituency. It creates enormous difficulties. Uh, but I do also believe in the glass half full, not the glass half empty. And um, I also believe in a positive approach. I believe in working with people. When there are people out there that want uh, to see people with disabilities um, achieve their potential, I'll work with them, all parties and none. Um, and to that, to, uh, to that extent, and I uh, see Pat Clark is here, and I'd like to acknowledge P Pat and the huge work he has done uh, to promote people with disabilities, access to services and so on throughout Europe. And I'm assuming John Dolan is here. If he's not, I just want to give a shout out yes. to John as well yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for the huge work John has done over a lifetime. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you know promoting uh, people with disabilities uh, and and access to services and supports, but I, I have taken up the role uh, uh, on an expert panel with Pat uh, uh, as part of o, um, OSCE ODIR, and the objective is to try and create toolkits and try and create a framework um, where uh, people uh, uh, with the, where parliaments can become more accessible, where politics can become. Uh, um, accessible uh, uh, to everybody, um, uh, particularly people with disabilities. 20 seconds there, Americans. Uh, so just, just to finish, we are doing good work in the Oireachtas. Uh, we have the OWL programme, we have um, uh, uh, Inclusion and Diversity Officer, and we have um, uh, what I would describe as probably the most artistic, friendly parliament in Europe. So things are happening. It's slow. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's painstaking, uh, but with a positive attitude and commitment by all parties because uh, disability isn't a, it's a political issue, but it certainly isn't a political football. And really what we need is political consensus and what can be achieved. Graham Agath. Thanks very much, Martin. <laughs> I, I, and thanks very much to everybody here. I think, I think though, I think, I'm going to be honest, and I'm not a politician, we're still not getting the spirit of the CRPD, the Convention of the Rights to Disability, which is... It's, 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 it's what's the zeitgeist now. You, we've all got it. You've adopted it. It's part of policy. It's part of the government going forward. Next government, whoever that's going to be. I don't know. I'm not involved in it. <laughs> it's about disabled people, lads. It's not about... You've got to think about that. Services, Martin, you're great talking about services. I use ESB, but I'll tell you something. You know, I don't want you putting more money in. So, again, it's like you have to distinguish between disabled people and 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 this, that's that's a separate thing. No, great, they do work, great work. But again, it's got people need to drive policy. Industry cannot drive policy. If you get industry driving policy in whatever sphere that is, you're, you're going to a different perspective. So my ask to you: Would you guys be thinking? I'm coming from DPO angle. So what I'm talking about is a collective, you know, agency from from the people we talk around the country. And one of the ideas they talked about was if we see the great work that Senator Flynn has done, um, Eileen Flynn, when the Taoiseach's nomination, mm. how how progressive? and modern, and morally, shall we say, pointing out, would it be of Ireland? Because I've seen how Ireland operates on an international stage, and we're very well respected as a social democracy. You know, we get, we get look, we, we're always flagellating ourselves, but we get a lot of things right too. Imagine if we did Taoiseach's nomination for a senator or whatever, but can't, you can't have a nomination for, a Shannon nomination for someone who has that, agency from who has ties to that disability rights movement who has ties to to dpos just like we have senator finn who works with her with coming from the irish traveler movements wouldn't that be fantastic what do you think well, John Dolan is here, who uh, was fantastic in the Shannad as an advocate for disability rights. Uh, you now have, um, as Martin has said, Martin himself in the Shannad, indeed Tom Clonan. So I, I think there's been a strong advocacy. Uh, I do think you're right, of course, James, about policy and you know needing to see impacts. And you know one of the ways in which Ireland has led on disability rights is was in the 1990s, and it was in fact a Labour minister, but it was Minister Mervyn Taylor who brought in the equality legislation groundbreaking legislation that included nine grounds of discrimination, including disability. And Ireland was a leader in the European Union at the time.
time in including that range of grounds, including membership of the traveller community, ethnicity, religion, but, but disability, crucially. And, you know, there was controversy at the time because the Supreme Court actually struck down some of that legislation on the basis that the disability provisions placed an in inverted commas too onerous a burden on employers. M most regrettably, I think it was a regrettable decision and the legislation was somewhat diluted as a result, but it was nonetheless important because it extended beyond employment rights but also into provision of services. So I think you're right, Ireland can be a leader. We've seen brilliant presidents. I know you have a girl from Mary Robinson from Mayo. But well, that's just because uh, you're Mayo and I'm not biased at all. Uh, you're not biased <laughs> at all. Uh, but look, you know, I think we have had a very strong progressive um, po politics around disability rights, but of course we can do better always you know and, and that's why today uh, i mean the disability act itself is not a great act though it's 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 it defines disability as a functional limitation and that's it and you're only given an assessment to need so i don't think we're I, i'll be honest i, I uh, don't okay. think we're doing great with, i think we got that's just me playing devil's advocate but i thank you ivana mark what do you reckon and then look, i'll go to pauline look it's throughout the world um the the, the number of uh, elected politicians with a declared disability is i think it's under one percent mm. uh, and well under one percent uh so you know, Ivana spoke earlier on about um, the gender quota, and absolutely, it's it, it, it's working. Maybe not as quickly as we'd like, but at least the political parties now are put in a position where they have to run 40% female candidates, and if they don't, their their, their funding is 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 reduced. Halved. Uh, it's halved. halved. Yeah. And what that means is that at least the people will have the choice to vote for women, and there will be women on the tickets. So what I'd like to see. And I've said this before in public forums, I'd like to see a diversity quota of, let's say, 10 to 15 um, percent. The, the mechanics of a diversity quota is something that would have to be worked out. Mm. Uh, but if you had a diversity quota of 15 percent, where the political parties are required mm. uh, to put forward 15 percent of their candidates uh, who uh, come from a diverse disability, uh, ethnic minority, uh, minority background, uh, well, well, then there's a requirement on the political system to at least give the public a choice uh, of uh, uh, candidates. And I, I think that that really does need consideration. I know the government under Peter Burke and the, uh, uh, and a couple of years ago made funding available for all the political parties to employ um, diversity and inclusion officers. And uh, I know in Fine Gael uh, that there's a handbook being developed and it's going to be launched next month, uh, which I fed into in terms of uh, advising the candidates selected for the local elections and what they need to do to respect and understand diversity, but also to make a conscious effort to go out and find candidates from a diverse uh, uh, minority disability background to actually stand for election. But if that was a requirement, if that was a quota, well, I think that would make a difference. Um, would you agree, Ivana? Yeah, and I think I think the dynamics. It's interesting what you say about the dynamics of it, because mm. it's otherwise it's just it's just tokenism. So you have to be careful about, and because otherwise diversity is great, but it's yeah. diversity through 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 authenticity, I suppose too. That's that's wonderful. Pauling, to you, lastly. Okay. Look, at the UNCRPD is transformative, but if things were right, there would be no need for that convention. Yeah. Mm. You know. In, uh, so I think we need to to change. There's a cultural change needed, uh, how we view people, disabled people, and instead of looking at them as people who need to be looked after, they need to be treated as equal citizens, participating in society, and you know, making available whatever it, people need to live independently and to work independently and to participate in society. And until that happens, really, we're not going to have enough involvement of people in politics because it's the same, you know, we could look at it the same as women, same as any other group. Um, Dominic's has, our politics has been dominated by male politicians for, for years. We do need to change it. Quotas help with that. But, you know, we need to see uh, people in, in all aspects of life engaging in all aspects of life and then they will be involved, you know, but that's a cultural change that's needed. Um, so, you know, that's going to, it, it's unfortunately going to take time, but, uh, you know, we, we have to, we can't give up, we have to keep working on that, you know. Mm. Thanks very much. And I think I think that's 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 really the summarise of it. We have to keep working on it. It is a cultural change in the CRPD, just to summarise it really quickly, because I have a train to catch and I want to get on. No, I'm only <laughs> um, I do. I, I, home, I want to get home by the Angelus. Um, no, I don't even know if it's on still. But I think too, it's 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 again, it does take a paradigm shift. If you get what the CRPD is about, which is a paradigm shift, mm. we're not talking about we're talking about human rights treaty. 
getting that idea, everything will flow from that and it becomes much easier. Looking at it from a dis point of disability equality rather than disability awareness. I know the distinction is kind of a little bit nebulous, but, it, but it's there. And I think too is that we've seen, we, we heard today from, from, from Brian from, from Women for Election, and we've heard from other, we've seen other social movements in this country, how vast the country has progressed in the last 15 years. Thankfully, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think it's, 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 this is the last great equality barrier, equity barrier, not just equality, equity, because yeah. equality is grand, you know. I'm going to rob my, 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 um, my colleague's line, Fiona Weldon, when she says, you know, the difference between equality and equity is very simple. Equality has been asked to disco, but equity has been asked to dance. And I think for those of us that remember the slow sets back in the day, do you remember them, Martin? I do. Yeah. Well, it's a good line, and I know Fiona. Uh, well, there you go, just before the national anthem and the bag of chips. But I think that's the point, is that if there's going to be equity, it's going to be fairness, and there has to be, and I keep going back to people dr drive policy. So thank you very much, um, everybody. The problem here is, I was, never, I was never asked to dance. Well, you never, well, you know, I tell you something, hey. I could ask you now, but I don't know how good we be. I'm in a wheelchair and you're blind, so I don't know how far we get. But, you know, but, but uh, have we time for questions? Yeah, All right, quick, fire ahead, Jerry. Is it Jerry, you, eh? Oh, we can hear you. Is it this? Ah, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> Welcome, Pauline. And this is this this is absolutely cross-party. Thank you. Uh, but the, all five leaders were asked, so I really welcome the fact that Ivana is the only one turned up. Just say that. Thanks, Jerry. Thank well done, Ivana. <laughs> the question I have is three quick questions for you. Uh, the first one is: within the structure of your party, would you allow sections for LGBT women, intercultural, and disability? because I think that really helps put in the structure itself of the party, gives them extra clout. Then the next thing is, um, will you allow, I was very interested in what Martin said about a dis, uh, diversity quota. Would you allow a diversity quota among those four groups? Would you allow diversity? Because I, I think Labour, or women in general in politics, has shown that a quota really works. And I've forgotten the third one because I'm getting a bit old on that, you know. So, so th just those two, please. Thank you very much. I, I, well, thanks very uh, much. Uh, yes and yes, Jerry, uh, would be my answer. And, um, uh, you know, look, at, uh, uh, you know, ultimately people have to vote uh, for candidates. Uh, so all you can really do is just make sure that the offering is there. Uh, but ultimately democracy will decide uh, and, and it's how people campaign. And what I would say to the NDA, if there were, uh, the message to the NDA is if there are candidates with disabilities out there and if the NDA can put any resources or supports behind them, uh, they could be quite amazed at how successful they are. So, like, um, you know, it, it is, it, it, having people on the ticket is one thing. Getting them elected is a completely different thing. I was, I, I was on the ticket for the first time in 99. I didn't get elected. Learned a lot from it. Had I been elected in 99, don't know what difference it would have made to my career. Uh, uh, but like, uh, it, it's a whole different ball game uh, uh, by being presented as a candidate on a ballot paper and actually uh, being deemed elected on the day of account. Grant, thanks, Martin. Then, I am Jerry. I should have also said you are a, a fantastic chair of Labour Disability mm -hmm. and taken over from the brilliant Mick. And we do have sections, as you've said, on uh, Labour Disability, Labour Women, Labour Intercultural, and uh, and Labour LGBT, and indeed Labour Youth. And all of those sections, we our experiences, they drive policy within the party, and they're hugely important um, in doing so. So I would say it's. I think it's a great model for other for 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 all political parties. Uh, and on the diversity quote. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, that report I mentioned, the report of the Gender Equality Committee, it's online, it's called Unfinished Democracy. And we advocated not just for the continuance and extension of the quotas, uh, that quota I mentioned, which is only applies, unfortunately, to dual elections. We wanted it extended to local elections. And we also wanted it to include what we call nested quotas, so that within it, you would also have quotas for other, for, for, in other words, for, to, to ensure diversity on grounds beyond gender. So you would have included 
included within that policies to encourage and bring forward women with from eth different ethnic backgrounds, from the traveller community, and indeed disabled women too. And we heard really, again, great testimony from disabled women's groups, among other uh, stakeholders, about the need for that. So I think the nested quota model is really good. Um, Jerry will know, Kathleen Lynch, our former colleague, used to say when she was asked about quotas, why would she support a women's quota? She said, because all my life I voted for mediocre men. <laughs> Just once I'd like to be able to vote for a mediocre woman. So it does give a choice to voters. That's the point of these quotas. Thanks, and, and Pauline? Yes, James. Um, well, Jerry, thanks for the question. And we do have at least three groups uh, you know, uh, uh, that you listed there anyway. And we have a quota on, as I said, on, our, on the women for a local election, which is a 50% quota where there are two candidates. If there's three, it can be two or one and one and the other. And then when it's four, it's two and two again. Um, I'll not go into the details of, of the, the issues I've had uh, with the men in the party uh, <laughs> identifying female candidates. Who, who think, oh God, my God, where are we going to get women from? I said, just look at the list. We've got loads of women in our party. Have you actually approached any of them properly without just, you know, they say, you wouldn't want to run for election, would you? You know, it's almost the negative, like, so, I mean, I and I have met women and sat down and talked to them and I've actually got, and I'm being, oh, well done. I was thinking, yeah, it, all it took was asking them. So yes, absolutely, the quotas work. They make us focus on making sure that we have a diverse panel of, of candidates going forward. But Martin's point about making sure that they're electable is very important too and it shouldn't just be the token woman, token disabled people or person or whatever, you know. So. Brilliant. That's all cast down. It's in legal right now. You've all commissioned that. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, thank it. Thank yourself. you for coming today. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, thanks, well, I'm not doing nothing. I'm just working. Um, but I really appreciate that and I'd like to thank the NDA too for hosting this, gig, uh, this conference on um, Article 29. Um, so I'm done now and I'm just going to pass it over to Aideen to talk, uh, to give the wrap-up session. So thank you very much and thank you. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Van. It was lovely meeting you. Thank you very much, James, and to uh, all our colleagues from uh, the Oireachtas uh, for their comments and perspectives in that regard. Um, just before I make some closing remarks to bring the proceedings to a close, we do have a short video address from uh, uh, Minister Roderick O'Gorman, who is uh, the Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. He wasn't able to join us today, but he did do a pre-recorded video message. So we'll just play that. Uh, it's very short, don't worry. <laughs> Good afternoon everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person today, however I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to you at the close of the National Disability Authority's annual conference on the subject of Article 29 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, covering participation in political and public life. I'm sure that the wide range of speakers you have had today from home and abroad provided valuable contributions and insights that will inform the work of the NDA and your knowledge of the best practice currently happening in Ireland and across Europe. I'm hopeful that the Electoral Reform Act 2022, brought forward by my colleague, the Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage, contains the necessary measures to open up opportunities for more accessible elections and more accessible information on voting and voter education. It's important that those of you attending today, in person and online, have the same opportunity to participate in public life and to see yourselves represented in public office. We cannot truly reflect the diversity of Irish society without this being the case. I know some of my Oireachtas colleagues participated in today's conference and I'd like to thank them for taking the time to highlight the importance of this representative role in our democracy. I look forward to reading the outcomes of this conference and to working with the relevant colleagues at national and local level to create an environment where disabled people can participate in our democratic processes on an equal basis with their fellow citizens. I also look forward to launching the National Disability Strategy next year, along with Minister Rabbit, which will set out a coordinating framework for further implement implementing the UNCRPD. Today's discussions were around one article of the Convention, but we are tasked with de developing a strategy that ensures continuous advancement of the Convention as a whole. To ensure effectiveness and impact of the strategy, we will need to prioritise so that we have an achievable number of goals. The prior prioritisation process won't be easy, but it is important that we have a national strategy to guide our direction and make best use of resources to impact those most in need. As you may know, my department is conducting a review of the Equality Acts. During the summer, 
I published a summary of the consultation and issues related to disability were included in many of the submissions. This review is important to ensuring that all people in our society are treated equally and I look forward to being able to provide further updates in relation to that review in due course. Congratulations to the NDA on a successful conference and thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you. So thanks very much to Minister O'Gorman for taking the time to uh, record that message and thanks also to Minister Abbott for opening our conference this morning. I hope you agree that it's been a very interesting and informative day. I want to thank all our speakers and chairs uh, who gave of their time and shared their perspectives. And very much uh, myself and our, my NDA colleagues will um, take all of that information on board. It will be very useful to inform the information and advice we feed into government in line with our, our role and remit. Um, I now just want to say some thanks to the people who've helped make today happen. As you all know, events like this and at this scale don't just uh, happen uh, by magic. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you very much to our ISL interpreters, Michael Feeney and then Shannon, who stepped in uh, very much at the last minute. Thank you to you both. Thanks. Thanks to our captioning service provided by Shane and Michelle. Uh, it's always uh, fascinating to me to watch how they capture uh, the, the, the work so accurately, particularly at the speed some of us speak at, uh, so thanks to them. Thank you to the Aviva team, uh, Holly O'Sullivan and all her team. It's our first time trying out this venue in over 10 years, um, so um, it's always uh, a bit nervous making uh, to try out a new venue, but uh, they've served us very well today, so thank you to them. And thank Thank you also to the IT team, CT Ireland, uh, so that's Christopher Herty and all his team um, uh, managing it all uh, very well, thank you. But I do want to say a big thank you to my NDA colleagues who've put a huge amount of work uh, into organising this conference and worked very hard in the background. And there's a, a good few names to call out because the conference team had uh, a bit of change and flux halfway through due to uh, some people moving on to bigger and brighter opportunities beyond the NDA, but I do want to say thank Thanks to Maeve O'Reilly and Jane Clare, who worked hard on it and then left us, <laughs> but also very much to those who stayed, Heather O'Leary, Tamar Keane, Down at O'Malley, Deirdre Nally and Edward Crean, also Roz Tamming and Kate Jennings, all of you who did a huge amount of work uh, in the lead up and today. And there are a large number of NDA and CUD colleagues around the room who've also been quietly working away on some of the tasks just for today. And I won't try naming them all because I know I will forget someone and then there'll be tears before bedtime. But your uh, contribution is very much appreciated uh, in helping the day uh, run smoothly. You will all receive an email over the next few days asking for your feedback on the conference. Please do provide it. Um, we don't um, promise that we have uh, ever delivered a perfect event. We're always looking for ways to improve year on year and your feedback is very helpful and important in that regard. Uh, on a final procedural note, when you're leaving, please do hand back your, your fancy name badges or you will be kind of aggressively frisked uh, as you try to go down the lift uh, so that we can get them back and reuse them for, for future events. But I want to thank you all again for coming and wish you a safe journey home.